Acts chapter number 2 this morning. How many of you enjoyed the worship service already? Amen. How many of you prayed for your pastor that the Lord will help me this morning? If you haven't, we're going to give you an opportunity to here in a minute. Uh, We'll tell you this morning that I continue to covet your prayers in the last few days. It seems like I've had a... uh, uh, an uptick, if you will, in, in my symptoms, and it's just been really difficult. And I don't understand what, why. I don't, sometimes it seems like the weather, I don't know if it's barometric pressure, most of you that know the medical issue that I have. And so this morning, uh, I'm going to do my best to share the Word of God. But if I don't get wound up tight like a clock, come back next week. We'll see what we can do next week for you. Uh, but I just want to share what the Lord's put on my heart. I feel like it's something that we all need. And I believe it's something we need to understand. A lot of times we preach the same, or a lot of folks do, they preach the same uh, material and content, and there's a lot of uncovered truths of God's Word and the uh, attributes of the Lord and things about living this Christian life. And I'd like to uncover one of those things, talk about something that a lot of times I believe we may even take for granted, that people just understand what it means. We're going to turn to the book of Acts chapter number 2 and verse number 32. And once you have it, if you will, stand to your feet for just a moment of reading. Acts chapter number 2. And we're going to read verse number 32 beginning. These are the, as the Bible would uh, show us, has been deemed for many years the Acts of the Apostles. Chapter 2, verse 32, if you have it, can you say amen? This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses, therefore being by the right hand of God exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost. How many of you glad he sent the promise of the Holy Ghost? He has shed forth this which you now see and hear. You see, Jesus had been crucified. He was resurrected from the dead. And now, hence, they're looking backward, and they're beginning to speak on that that promise of the Holy Ghost and says, He has shed forth this which you now see and hear. In other words, everything that's already been done, you're beginning to see these things come to pass. Verse number 34, it said, For David is not ascended into the heavens. But he saith himself, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou on my right hand till I make thy foes, thy foes, thy footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made this, that same Jesus. Now, this is powerful. That same Jesus who, who crucified, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and and Christ. Now look at verse number 37. A very interesting thing happens. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? I want to pause there and tell you this morning, I have sat in council with different people through the years that are going through a a place of their life where the Lord is dealing with them as He did with these people that are standing ringside through the mouth of the preacher's anointed words. And as I sit and counsel with people in this manner, one of the things that people either say with their mouth or they convey with their words, what do I need to do from here? I know what God's doing in me, but what do I need to do from here? Where do I go from here? How many of you realize that not everybody cut their teeth on the back of a church pew? There are some folks that have no idea what this is about. They have no understanding, really. But he goes on to say, Until I make thy foes thy footstool, therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made this, this same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. When they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent, be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall do what? You shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. 
For this promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord God shall call. It wasn't for just a few. It wasn't for the church upper echelon. It was for everybody. It was for the fellow that had woke up from a night's drunkenness underneath a bridge somewhere, and it was for the fellow sitting in the prince's palace. It was for everybody that whosoever would come to the Lord through obedience. Is that right? And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. Do you know the pastor can get up, the preacher can get up, and he can, he can expound on the truth and deliver God's word in the most proficient way. But if you don't receive it, somebody say receive. If you don't receive it, you may not receive what God has for you. Before I can receive the gift, I must receive the giver. I want to say that again. Before I receive the gift, I've got to receive the giver. Is that right? And so, verse number 41, then they gladly received his word. They were baptized, the Bible said. And that same day, there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. I want you to say this with me. Look what conviction will do. Say it again. Look what conviction will do. How many people were added to the church? 3,000. 3, Look what conviction will do. I'd like to talk to you about something that the Holy Ghost has been dealing with your pastor about. I want to preach to you this morning on this subject title, Under Conviction. Under Conviction. Will you raise your heart and hands to the Lord and let's begin to pray and ask God to have His way. Lord God, this morning we're thankful for the Word of God. For the next few moments, I pray that you'll use me, Lord, to declare the precepts of the Word of God. And I pray that the anointing of the Holy Ghost will be here. And this very subject that we intend to declare this morning on conviction, let that same conviction be in this house. And we can all give you praise for everything that you do in the mighty name of Jesus. And everyone can say amen. The man of God that is speaking here, Peter, he begins to remind those in the audience that unlike David, their patriarch, Jesus was no longer in the tomb, but he had risen. They had a lot of confidence in this patriarch by the name of David. A lot of their stories are built around David and Goliath and King David and all of his accomplishments and how that David, when in one portion, Saul began to look out and realize people were chanting and saying that David has killed his tens of thousands while that, that Saul has only killed his thousands. And this same David who is looked at as a patriarch of the faith of the Jewish people the, the man of God begins to point this concept out and he says, this same, P, this same David that declared that God was going to put his enemies on, on the left and the right and, and all of this, he, this same David is in the grave, but, but Jesus on the other hand, the God that David had referred to, this same Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father. This same Jesus is not dead. He was crucified, but this same Jesus is not in a tomb like the patriarchs, maybe Moses or somebody else. He is not likened unto that, but he is a risen Savior. And he goes on to explain to them that he's no longer in the tomb, but risen. This same Jesus has now sent the comforter. Somebody say comforter. That is what the Holy Ghost is. He is the comforter. The Bible refers to him as being that comforter. He is the alongside help to be in that indwelling force that comes into the believer. The Holy Ghost is an agent of truth that brings men to Christ. What I want you to see this morning, Brother Coon, come here for just a minute. I promise well, nobody will push you around this, this Sunday. We'll do a little something different this week. But we want to explain to you so you understand the concept. Come here for a minute, Brother Devin. You see, when the Lord begins to deal and begins to draw you, come here, Brother Eric, for a minute. I know that you'll help me out here. We're going to say that the intended target is Devin over here. The Lord's trying to convict. He's trying to deal with his heart, trying to bring him to Christ. We're going to say that Brother Eric is Christ. I want you to stand over there a little farther. You're all a little too close. You look like you're going to 
gang up on somebody here. For, praise the Lord. Beat somebody up, you know. But the Lord is trying to draw. He's trying to draw Devin to him. That's, that's what God wants to do. Wants to have fellowship. Restore the broken fellowship that took place. The brokenness in the Garden of Eden. And so the Holy Ghost acts as an agent, a drawing agent that goes between Jesus and that intended soul, that one that he's going to draw. And so you're going to be the Holy Ghost this morning, okay? And so when the Lord begins to deal with the heart, he uses the Holy Ghost to come over. And I want you to put your hand on it. I want you to put your hand right here. And what he does, he begins to work on that man's heart. Not so much on the mind, but he begins to deal with the heart. And so what begins to happen is this person comes under conviction. Somebody say under conviction. It is the Lord drawing him. And the Bible said no man comes to the Father but by him. And I want you to know that he is an agent between Jesus and the Father. And so he goes and he draws on his heart. Now I want you to let go for just a minute. And so when the Holy Ghost deals with the heart, you have one of two choices, maybe more, but right now I'm going to preach it like this. You have at least one of two choices. You can either accept and receive the convicting that God is putting on your heart and when he turns and tries to lead you back to the Lord you can follow the leading of the Holy Ghost you can respond to the drawing of the Holy Ghost or you can stay put where you're at and you can ignore or try to push off the conviction because there's a lot of people that are under conviction and you have this misunderstanding that if you get under conviction well you're automatically going to give in and retreat and then let the Lord come into your life. But that is not always the case. I can tell you that there have been many of church services where that I've watched the Holy Ghost. If we could see in the spiritual, you would have seen him going back to the pew and you'd have seen him dealing with the heart. He's beginning to work on that heart. And inside, that person may be smiling sitting there, but they began to get a little jittery. They began to feel the drawing power of the Holy Ghost. And they're under conviction. There's a drawing power and a drawing force that says come on, come all ye that are heavy laden and I will give you rest and you don't have to know all the scripture in the world, you just know that he is drawing you I want you to understand this morning it's important and relevant to realize you can go into a tribe in the deep dark jungles of the bush of Africa and you could preach the gospel to people that have never heard the name Jesus and they don't have to know what Matthew chapter number 24 says says and they don't have to know what the book of Acts said and they may not understand what Paul said to the church at Ephesus when he said you've left your first love. They may not know a lick of scripture but there's one thing that begins to happen. There is this age under the Holy Ghost conviction that begins to deal with the heart and begins to deal with the heart and after a while that heart becomes under conviction and that heart says I've got to move or I'm going to have to to stay. Somebody say you gotta move or you're gonna stay. One of the two. You can't come on now. I've watched people that try to brush off conviction. Try to push the conviction aside. And when conviction comes, uh, they stiff arm the Lord and they look the other way. They're looking the other direction. Conviction is trying to get a hold of you. The drugs, uh, you enjoy the drug. Come on now. I'll tell you something may seem kind of comical in a way. But while I was down south, I was doing the ceiling work in one pastor's church and we began to talk about the gifts of the spirit and the Holy Ghost moving and such and the pastor told me that one day he was down in the altar and a gentleman said I want to be baptized in the Holy Ghost and, and so that man said that pastor looked at him and he said well he said let me pray for you he said okay so he laid back and began to pray for that man and began to say God fill him with the Holy Ghost and he said while I was praying for him I I noticed uh, that there was the fragrance uh, of cigarettes on him Uh, he said so I began to pray Lord uh, deliver him from those cigarettes Uh, and he had been praying for this fellow for quite a while and all of a sudden uh, the guy opened up his eyes uh, and looked at him and said whoa wait a minute now preacher he said he said I kind of enjoy my cigarettes now don't go praying that he said he looked at him he kind of smiled he said well son you might not be ready for the Holy Ghost then because anything that is 
is bigger than anything, any desire for the things of the world. That is greater for your desire for the things of God. You can come on, you need to lay down, put aside anything if the Holy Ghost is in it. Now, I've had times before, hey amen, I've got to have somebody else down. Come here, Brother David. If it, before it's over, we get the whole church up here. But Brother David's going to represent that preacher who's got good intentions, uh, but sometimes gets a little carried away. Come on now. You're the carried away, good intentions preacher. And so sometimes, uh, you know, you come over here and you not let the Holy Ghost do his job uh, and you're going to take his place. I'm going to just push the Holy Ghost out of the way. And so you're going to come in uh, and you're going to tell him like it is. Uh, you're going to tell him what he needs to change. Uh, you're going to tell him where he's been. Uh, you're going to tell him what's going wrong. Uh, you're going to tell him why he's uh, in this state and place. Uh, and so what happens when you try to do the Holy Ghost job, uh, you step in the way. No man comes to the Lord because a preacher got in the way. But he comes through the drawing power of the Holy Ghost. Uh, have you ever seen a preacher use a pulpit as a whipping post uh, to let somebody know somebody walked into church uh, they look around and see something else that they're going to preach on that, that morning. Let me tell you, that is carnal and every preacher that does so will give an account in the day of judgment. Can you say amen? And so there are a lot of people that may get in the way. There are other times. Uh, come on over here. We're going to change We're gonna change uniforms and this time uh, you're going to be that carnal, well-meaning Christian uh, who sits in the church, uh, got a boatload of their own problems uh, and you're not the preacher now. You're just another church member who don't know how to mind their business. Uh, and so you're going to come... Yes, I did say that. So you're going to come over here and get right up and push the Holy Ghost out the way. The Holy Ghost has been trying to deal with that heart and you're going to get in there and don't you know that it's wrong for you to go do that? Don't you know this and don't you know that? Well, the reason why you can't pay your bills and the reason why, and let me tell you, good sound instruction is good. Come on now, wisdom is good. But don't ever try to play the Holy Ghost. Say amen, somebody. Don't ever try to take the Lord's job away from him. Let me tell you the sad part about it. Step aside for just a minute right here, Mr. Carnal Christian. And come back over here, Mr. Holy Ghost. Uh, just there are times uh, that the Holy Ghost is working on that heart. And I've watched people before. Man, I'm so far away from my notes. Y'all pray for me. But the Holy Ghost uh, is dealing with the heart. And sometimes, uh, I want you to just put your foot out like you're getting ready to make a step. They are so close uh, to getting what they they need. They are so close to, to letting God come in and do a work on them. And just about the time uh, that they're ready to say, yes, God, I will go all the way. Uh, he's got them to that point. Somebody say the Holy Ghost got them there. Here comes Brother Do Better. Here comes Brother going to tell everybody how to do it. And he's going to step in there and kind of squeeze in between him and the Holy Ghost and try to do what he thinks is right. And guess what? The whole time he's pointing his finger, step back, step back, step back, step back. There's going to be a lot of blood on a lot of people's hands in the day of judgment because you made a lot of people step back, step back, step back because the Holy Ghost wants you stepping forward, stepping forward, leading you to the closeness of Jesus Christ. Can you say amen, somebody? Somebody say, God, help us all. You better be careful when you get trying to play the Holy Ghost uh, because it is his job to convict. Somebody say it's the Lord's job. It is the job of the Holy Ghost to convict that heart. I'll never forget. I don't know why I feel like telling this, but since I'm so far off my notes, I might as well just preach anyhow. But years ago, we were at a camp meeting. I'll never forget this by God's grace. And there was a man demon possessed. Now you're demon possessed, okay? So there was a man that was demon possessed. And I remember some of you remember Brother Tim Baggett, who's preached here. You can't hardly forget him. He looks like he's seven foot eight or something. This big fella, and I love him to death. Great man. But Brother Timmy and I, we go way back. I've been knowing him for years. And in this camp meeting, there was a gentleman in that service who I just preached a revival at their church. And this man was full of the devil. I'll never forget the last night of revival. We're going to step back from the camp meeting for just a minute. The last night of the revival that happened just before this camp meeting, uh, there was something that happened in that service 
church and I was praying for people in the altar and this guy comes up for prayer. I began to pray for him and that demon spirit inside of him, I watched him. I've never seen anything like it before or since. He looked like a human basketball. He was standing close to a wall and Brother Coon, as I prayed for him, he bounced off the wall and off my hand, off the wall, off my hand, off the wall and off my hand, just repeatedly. Well, in that service, uh, somebody, some well-meaning person came up there and got in the middle of everything and it died down and he never got the victory that he needed to get. He never got broke through. Now here we are in a camp meeting and never forget this by God's grace. We're up there and the Holy Ghost has fell. Conviction is in the house uh, and all of a sudden I see that guy sitting a few rows back. His wife was trying to get him prayed through. His wife knew he had some issues uh, and she brought him to church that night. She had already gone to the altar. There he sat in that pew. You could tell conviction was there. And I looked over at it. And I, I told Brother Tim, I said, you think we ought to ask him would he like to pray? Most of you that know me, I'm not one to go back and do. I ask somebody if they want to pray unless I know that the Holy Ghost told me to do it. And so we went back to him and said, would you like to pray? He shook his head, yes. We got him down to the altar. We began to pray for him. And Sister Myers can tell you the same thing. That fellow, there was an altar that stretched. I mean, that altar must be 15 or 20 foot long. Amen. It's a very, very solid wood, heavy altar. He was down on his knees. And Brother David, all of a sudden, that devil rose up in him. He put, picked that altar bench uh, clean up over his head and was about to throw it across the church. Uh, and all of a sudden, uh, I met the Holy Ghost came over and I laid my hand on him. I said, in the name of Jesus, uh, I rebuke you. All of a sudden, that, that altar hit the floor. And I want you to know we began to pray. He was laid out on the floor one demon after another demon coming out of that man. But right in that camp meeting uh, was a row full of well-meaning people who thought they had it all together. And so this one gentleman uh, sitting on that row, they hadn't got into the service. They hadn't worshipped. They weren't in the altars. They weren't praying for anybody. They were just sitting there spectating, waiting on the moment. All of a sudden, uh, I guess it was like, you know, roll call. One man stood up so the whole row got up. We're down here praying. We've been praying for a while. Demons coming out. All of a sudden, a whole row of these people come down there and this man, I'm just going to demonstrate to you what was happening. I want you to sit on the floor for just a minute. Hey man, you, you'll forgive me later. All of a sudden, we're praying for this guy. Come on over here. You're going to be Brother Timmy. We're praying and here comes this other fella and he squeezes right in between uh, everything that we were trying to pray for gets right in the middle and then he sits on top of the man's chest. I don't want you to do that. And so me and Brother Timmy, we backed up a little bit. We let him pray for him. And all of a sudden, uh, hey man, I watched that guy. He scooted closer and closer and closer to the wall. Next thing you know, the guy started turning purple. This fellow was sitting on his chest. I looked at him. I said, hey man, I was real trying to be real nice. I said, hey man, he can't breathe. Somebody say, that ain't God. Come on now. You're going to cast the devil out. This ain't a WWF. Come on now. Am I telling the truth? But I was real nice about it. I said, hey, man, he can't breathe. I watched that man. You'd have thought that uh, I was out in the world. We were both in a bar somewhere. He looked up at me with this look. He said, well, then you pray for him. I started to say we were praying for him or you came over here in the first place. So he got up, got mad, puffed up, went and sat back down. And the man got prayed through that night. What I'm trying to tell you is, you better be careful. You're trying to take on your own agenda. Whether it be with your children, whether it be your grandchildren, whether it be somebody in a church. You better let the Holy Ghost do what he's trying to do. Come on somebody and say, God, let us see conviction in the church again. You can be seated. Come on now. Raise your hand and say, Lord, help us this morning. It is in that moment in the passage that we have read to you this morning that the Bible says, I, 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 I'm, I tell you the truth. It's expedient for you that I go away. If I go not away, the comforter will not come to you. But I, but I, if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove. Somebody say reprove. 
He will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. That goes right along with our text. Why? Because when the words were spoken under the anointing of the Holy Ghost, the Bible tells us they were pricked in their heart. And when they got pricked in their heart, they said, what must we do? That is the right response when the Holy Ghost responds. I've watched people get under conviction. And let me, let me tell you, all of a sudden they've got bladder control issues. Oh, Lord God convictions here. I'm going to the rec room. Come on now. All of a sudden, uh, they all of a sudden that baby, they want to change the baby's diaper and it ain't even wet. All of a sudden, they've got bubble gum they need to chew. All of a sudden, so they got a book they got to read. Uh, they start looking the other direction. If I look the other way, the preacher won't look at me. Let me tell you, oh, the Holy Ghost conviction will get a hold of you if you go into bed with your eyes closed. You go to work and ain't no preacher around. Holy Ghost conviction will We'll find you wherever you're at. Somebody say amen. I want you to say this with me this morning. I want you to think about this. The truth, the truth precedes conviction. Truth will instigate conviction. The truth sets the pavement for conviction. This is the reason why that when the preacher goes to preaching and your hearts are racing and you're like sitting on the edge of your pew and you're thinking, he's talking about me. How did he know what I did last night? I, I didn't know. I really didn't. But through the preacher's anointed words, the Holy Ghost pierces through and he pricks the heart. He convicts the heart of sin. Somebody say, make it real, Lord. They were under conviction. Have you ever heard somebody make this statement before? They're just under conviction. How many times have my wife and I, we've been sitting around, and all of a sudden, as pastors, we see a situation arise within the church where somebody is fighting against God. And she may look to me or I may look to her and say, they're just under conviction. Conviction will make you uncomfortable. Oh yeah. I've watched people before. They're sitting in the chair. <laughs> because conviction has a way of making you uncomfortable. Oh yeah. You say, how do you know, Pastor? Because I've been under conviction plenty of times myself. There were times that the preacher was preaching, and I'm inside, I'm going, Ooh. like I've preached before, and I smell, I smell hide smoking in his mind. Boy, he's got my number, and I'm just smiling when he's looking my way, <laughs> like, it ain't me, when knowing good and well, I'm under conviction. Come on now. You see, when years ago, Years ago, I want to kind of explain to you what conviction might be like. Years ago, we were doing a tent revival in Center Hill, Florida. If you've been under my preaching, you may have heard me tell this story at least once or twice. But we were doing a tent revival in, in Center Hill, Florida. And uh, I don't know, we'd been doing this for several nights, if not a couple of weeks at that time. And one night, it was my turn to preach. And so I got up and I preached. I remember I was preaching about the blood of Jesus. I had brought this little uh, pill bottle filled it full of ketchup to make it look like uh, blood and talked about how that it's the remedy and, blood, you know, all that. Well, in preaching, I'm telling you, there are times, some of you will understand what I'm talking about, where the anointing is just really heavy and where the conviction is just so thick, you just, I mean, you just feel it. It makes saved people want to go to the altar. Come on now. And there was so much conviction in that service. And all of a sudden... I'm giving the altar call. People are coming to the altar. They're weeping and crying. They're begging God for help. And I look over, and here comes this little Chevy Chevette. Y'all remember them cars, Chevy Chevette? It was even old back then. It pulled up, little car, and it, I don't know how this guy, he must have been, he was like Brother Timmy. He was a big guy. He must have been sitting in the back seat like Shaquille O'Neal or something, ripped the whole front seat and just sitting in the back seat. But this guy opened up the door, Brother David, and when he lumbered out of that car, he stood there and he looked real crazy like, 
up in under the tent, a whole church full of people worshiping the Lord, people in the altar. And so he started making his way over to that tent. I, I remember him ducking underneath the flap of the tent, and he walked in and he just stood there and he looked around. He just kept looking. I don't know. You know, we live in a crazy world. I don't know what this guy's going to do. I don't know what is on his mind. And so I made eye contact with him. And he looked directly at me. He goes, what's going on in here? I looked at him. I said, we're giving an altar call. He said, well, all I know, he was drunk now. He said, I was driving down that road right there. And he said, by the time I passed this little tent, he said, all of a sudden, I got to. He said, there it is again. What is this all over me? His hair was standing up on his arms. I just looked at him. I said, that's the conviction of the Holy Ghost. He looked over and he said, what are you preaching about? I said, I'm a preaching about the blood. He said, I don't know what it is, but I want it. Let me tell you, that man went down to the altar that night. God touched his life. Let me tell you, that's what conviction will do. Conviction will reach out into the crowd. Let me tell you, conviction ain't confined to the four walls of the church. You think you can run away from the conviction just because you don't get up when the preacher preach and you go outside and sit in your car just because you go to the restroom and sit on the toilet waiting for the service to get over with. Come on, now, I'm going to preach it anyhow. Just because you look over, Pick up a baby and play with the baby as if somehow another God don't know what's going on. God will let conviction follow you to the post office. God will let conviction follow you to the checkout line of Walmart. God will let conviction follow you down to the schoolhouse while you're taking the FCAT test. There'll be conviction, conviction, conviction. Somebody say, God, we need more conviction in the church. Raise your hand and give God the praise. I believe there are people right now I believe there are people right now in this church service that are under conviction. I believe there are people that did not come to church this morning. They're sitting at home and they've been under conviction. In the last couple of weeks, I've had a few different people reach out to me. And they say, Pastor, what time is church? I haven't seen them in a while. Pastor, what time is church? It's at Sunday school's at 10 o'clock and morning worship's at 10.30. Well, I've been doing some thinking and God's been dealing with my heart because you're under conviction. I, said, I haven't talked to you in a while. It ain't because of me. Something, something has got a hold of you. Have you ever felt so compelled to get in the altar and pray or to go to a particular church or visit a certain revival, that convicting power of God that says, I've got something that I want to do, but you must yield to the conviction. You see, there's a few things that conviction is not, and it's relevant, and I want to teach you something here if you didn't already know. For those of you that don't understand conviction, conviction this morning it is not condemnation. Well, when I read in the Bible, the Bible said that Christ came not into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved. Condemnation is not what conviction is. You see, condemnation causes us to look to self, where conviction causes us to look to God. You condemn a man, he looks inwardly at himself on how I can do this and how I can do that. But conviction causes a man to look to God. Come on. Conviction is not simply an emotional feeling, even though you may have your emotions stirred when you feel conviction. Conviction is not guilt. Somebody say it ain't guilt. Guilt is an emotion. It stems from an internal balance where our conscience tells us we have violated our own boundaries. Can you make it real for me, Pastor? Well, you might be in sin and you may have set a sinful boundary and that may be guilt, but that's not conviction. You may walk into the bar, order a round of drinks and not pay for it and walk out the door and be, feel guilt because you didn't pay your tab. 
where conviction will say, son, you should have never been in there in the first place. Come on out. But guilt is not, guilt is not conviction. And I've watched people in the church try to guilt somebody into serving God. Better be careful. Because guilt will never fix the trouble with sin. Guilt is a band-aid. Guilt only reminds you of just how bad you are. But you say, well, pastor, what is the difference with conviction? On the other hand, conviction is this. Conviction is the convincing. The word conviction comes from the original word in the original Greek to convince. When you convict The original translated word was the root word to convince. So he is, in a sense, trying to convince his people. It is God's way of convincing the soul that there is a need for change and to restore the void of fellowship with God. God comes along and he tries to, with conviction, allow you to see your need for God and your need for change. Is there anyone this morning that says, I have a few places of my life that I need some change, Brother Myers? Conviction is the vehicle that brings us to the front door of repentance. Conviction is the vehicle that brings us to the front door of repentance. Why did the Lord lay it on my heart to say it that way? I'm going to tell you the reason I believe is because conviction brings you to the door But whether you step through the door of repentance is still whether you put your hand to the knob and turn the knob. It's up to you. How many this morning says there's probably a lot more folks that are under conviction than we care to understand or know? You see, conviction is God's drawing us into change. It is convincing us that we need to change and it is revealing the need for change. Conviction will allow you to see God's boundaries, not yours. Conviction reaches out to your heart and says, these are the things that have fallen by the wayside, but I want to restore our fellowship with you. God convicts that heart, and that soul says yes, or that soul says no. Conviction this morning, it is a visitation of God's presence in and around your life. It's God knocking on the door of your heart. It's God whispering in the ear of your soul. I wanted to, I wanted to, I wanted to preach this part to you specifically like this because there are some of you, you are riding along in the cab of the work truck. You're going about your daily task, doing the lawn, washing the dishes or the laundry, folding the towels, and you have not been able to put your finger on the reason why it's as if there's a cloud around me. I'm feeling this dealing lately. It's almost as if I go to bed and when I'm I'm all alone with my thoughts, it's as if I feel God is dealing with me to change some things in my life. There are times that I feel like God's trying to show me this is the life that you want. But on the other hand, Pastor, my flesh is pulling me in the other direction. My friends, my habits, my addictions, the the flesh is pulling me in a different direction. And you, you know God's there. How many of you know exactly what I'm talking about? Brother Benefield, before I gave my life to the Lord in 1997, there was a certain level of God's dealing in my life. But I wasn't surrendering. I wasn't fully letting go and letting God do what He wanted to do in my life. There was no full surrender. I've shared with the church before that there were dreams that the Lord allowed me to have right before I got saved. In one particular dream, I dreamed that the rapture was taking place. And I was in a house. And in this house... The trumpet sounded. And when I heard the blast of the trumpet, I jumped up on my feet and I ran to the bedroom where I planned to kneel down and say, Lord, forgive me of my sins. Would you please accept me? And all of this. And then I realized in my dream that I had waited too late, Sister Patricia. 
in another dream. These were, these were dreams that were so incredibly powerful that I cannot even put into vocabulary, human vocabulary, what happened to me. My wife could tell you. She was praying for me. And it may seem like a joke and her anointing my tea and my spaghetti and my gas pedal and my brake pedal and anointing everything in sight. But it was working. Conviction was coming into my life. Mamas, don't be afraid. If you have to, go in the bedroom and anoint the dresser. Anoint the walls, anoint the computer, anoint the cell phone, anoint whatever you got to do. You say, Pastor, that's crazy. You call it crazy, whatever you want to. You can look at it. Your pastor is here today, and I believe a lot of it has to do with a praying wife who refused to take no for an answer. But I did not want to yield to the Lord. And in this other dream that the Lord gave me, I laid down in the bed one night, and my wife had anointed my side of the bed. And I tossed and I turned. And if you knew us, we sleep on one side of the bed. We've been doing this. We've been married for almost 27 years now. That's a pretty long time for somebody that's my age. We've been together forever. But if you ever paid attention, you know we've been, we sleep on the same side of the bed. We've been doing that forever. But this one night, I looked over her and I said, I can't get comfortable on this side of the bed. I said, switch me sides. I was just as lost as I could be. You know what it was? I was under, I was under conviction. So the Lord was dealing with me, but I laid on her side of the bed. Later on, she said that she had whispered, you sorry devil. So I laid there, and in this particular dream, my wife and I, we owned a a big hotel in a dream. We've never owned anything big except a lawnmower. But in this dream, we owned a big hotel. And what we would do is we would live in this hotel and we would, it would get dirty and cluttered with junk and stuff. And about the time that it would get so full of junk and crud and everything everywhere, we would just take our little bit of stuff and we would go to another room in the hotel to another one like we were starting all over. Well, in this dream, I went to the other room and I laid down on the bed. And when I laid down on the bed and I put my head down, all of a sudden, and no, I don't get into all this paranormal activity and everything, but I'm just telling you an absolute fact. As I lay there in that bed, in my dream, a demonic spirit that I felt come over me is a power that you cannot describe. It's the most awful feeling. And I was being choked out. I spun around on the bed, not literally, but in the dream. And in this dream, I remember I could see the head wall at the other side of the bed. And I was sliding across the bed and I was picking up speed and I was about to slam my head right into the wall. And I was violently shaking, literally, in my sleep. All of a sudden, my wife reached over and grabbed a hold of me and said, Honey, are you okay? And when she did, I sat straight up in the bed. Eyes wide open, and I said, pray for me. Demons are after me. Somebody say, you were under you were under conviction. It took me a while for the Lord to show me what the meaning of that dream was. You see, I had made, I had made a habit, if you will, of doing what Pastor Myers, you've heard me call, get a case of the do-betters. So me and my wife will argue like cats and dogs. I won't ever talk to you like that no more, baby. I won't ever do you like that no more. I won't never cheat no more. I won't never lie no more. And I, so the room gets dirty and then you think you're going to start over by going to another room and just start over. But the problem is if you don't quit your dirty habits, the next room will be just as dirty as the last one. The next one will be just as much of a mess as the last one. Let me tell you, some of you people that you got family or you know people that go from marriage to marriage to marriage to marriage. The reason why some people that marriage, marriage, marriage don't work is because they're expecting a brand new situation to turn everything around. When really the problem is it's the same old you. 
And when you get under conviction, you need to yield to that conviction and let God begin the transformation of your life. Otherwise, you're going to do the same mess to Johnny that you did to Fred. You're going to do the same mess to Sally that you did to Betty. Let me come on now, somebody, and help me preach for a while. The truth is uh, that when conviction settles in, uh, it begins to deal with you. You see, what I'm telling you is that conviction gives an atmosphere where the presence of God brings an invitation to the soul that says, come on up a little bit higher I remember going to a job site this all happened within a few months time I remember going to a job site there was this fella he was an electrician to this day I wish I could go to that man and I wish I could shake his hand and tell him I appreciate what he tried to share with me but one day I'm on the job and you got this guy coming over and when you're lost you know you're just thinking Lord please you know really we're at work come on now I ain't got time for that And this guy come over to me. He says, so do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? No. Well, why not? Well, I try to change the subject. You know them people that try to dodge the bullet? Laugh it off with a joke. Well, he wasn't having that. He just kept on. I thought this joke about driving me crazy. About Jesus and this and that. And he said, do you know where you would spend eternity if you died right now? I said, well, most likely I know where I'd spend eternity. Probably wouldn't be the best place. I mean, reality. The Bible said that one man plants, one man waters, and God does what? You know what he did? He planted a seed. Or maybe he watered the seed that was already planted somewhere else. But he came along and he was used by God. He drove me crazy. But when it was over with, it left me thinking, I'm riding down the road. Who's that guy telling me what? I was under conviction. You know what God was doing? God was letting the Holy Ghost deal with me. Let me tell you, he can sometimes use the words of the preacher. That's why I told you earlier that truth precedes conviction. It is through truth that conviction comes in. The Holy Ghost, the Bible said when he comes, he will testify of Jesus. And the Bible calls the Holy Ghost the spirit of The spirit of truth. And when the Holy Ghost is in it, he's going to reveal truth. And that truth, it's going to get right inside of you. It's going to make you twitch. It's going to make you look like you got Tourette's uh, on the inside. Come on now. Because he is dealing with you. And then you sit there so pompous. Anybody here deal with anxiety? Come on now. Tell the truth. I know it don't sound spiritual. But anybody here deal with anxiety? You know, I, I would have told somebody that had a demon years ago, but when I started dealing with anxiety myself, and I'm like, Lord, I'm praying, I'm seeking you, I love you, I'm safe, safe, I feel the Holy Ghost, and I got anxiety. How many of you know what it's like when you got anxiety in your room full of people and trying to act normal? On the inside, it feels like you just drank a gallon of concentrated caffeine. Come on now. There are some of you under conviction trying to act normal. And on the inside, you're all toe up. Come on now. Woo, hallelujah. I told you that the Lord sent me here to preach to you about being under conviction because there is only one remedy for that conviction. You're not going to get away from it. He's going to continue to deal, continue to strive. He'll go with you to work if he has to. You'll be sitting there at the job and all you can hear is that big old mouth preacher from Grace Street saying the same old thing over and over and over in the back of your head. So you turn on something on the radio trying to get him out of your head and all you can hear is the truth. Truth, the truth, the truth. Because the Bible said the truth, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. There's some of you in the bondage of addiction, in the bondage enslaved by sin. Amen. Transgression of the law. But God said, I've come that you have life and life more abundantly. Somebody lift your hand and give him praise. Conviction is the love letter of God inviting you to restore the relationship. With him. Anybody remember them little letters we used to write when we were kids? Nowadays they just send a text message, I guess, or a Snapchat. But when we was kids, this is going back just a little bit, not too far, Angelica, but just a little bit. Before cassettes. And we write this little letter. 
I think you are cute. Would you go out with me? Check yes. Or no, and then you draw a little box for yes. And you draw a little box for no. Every little boy's nightmare is a box check no. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> no. Let me give you a little something you can tell your kids. You can act like you, you come up with it. Whenever I was younger, I'm going to tell you this is a little off my message. Y'all forgive me. But I told my kids, I said, when I was younger, I said, I couldn't stand rejection. So I come up with a little saying. And I came up with it on the fly. We was at a skating ring. Y'all remember that? We was at the Mount Door skating ring. And I seen this little girl. I thought, boy, she's pretty. So I think, I'm going to ask her to couple skate with me. Some of y'all don't know what in the world that is. I couldn't skate real good. I'm one of them fellas that would leave with big old blisters on my feet trying to pretend like I knew how to skate on a roller skates. I could skateboard, but not. I went up to that little girl. I said, would you like to couple skate with me? She was standing there with a couple of her friends. She looked at me. She said, with you? All of a sudden, something rose up in me. I thought, hmm, you just did not. I said, well, I just felt sorry for you standing up here by yourself, so I figured I'd ask you. Couple skate with me. <laughs> Woo. Check yes or no. So will you accept or will you not? But let me tell you something. Whenever the Lord brings conviction in your heart, it is an invitation of a love letter like that God comes along. He says, will you receive me or will you reject me? He said, Pastor, what are you supposing I do? I'm under conviction. Get up and pray. My Lord. Some folks will wear us church folk out. I'll be praying for like months. God, save their soul. And when they finally get saved, I'm like, Lord Jesus, on to the next one. Come on out. What do you mean? Because some folks will wear us out. Because you get to praying and the next thing you know, I think sometimes they do it on spite. And they get worse and worse. And you're like, Lord, is my prayer even working? But God is sending conviction on them. When they start, when they stop answering your phone call, and they get stoved up, and they get mad, look like they drank a cup of vinegar, act like it too, stop responding to your text message, that's all right, baby, I know you're under conviction. Yes, Lord. They under conviction. I don't know what that problem is. That's all right, cause I'm on. There was a lady in the church we used to attend. That lady would crack us up. She would get up. She was an older lady, and you know, I told my wife this the other day. I said, "You better watch out." I said, "I've learned. I've been watching some of these older folks." I said, "When they get up about fifty or sixty, they just start saying whatever's on their mind." I don't know if it's just like you get to a place where like I don't live too much of life. I ain't got no time for nobody's junk. And I'm just going to tell you the way it is. You may not want to hear this, but I'm about to tell you. And I was, come on now. How many says, Lord, help that preacher? But the truth is that there are some people, they need somebody who's going to come along and actually tell them the truth. They don't want to hear it. Thank God for Aunt Betty who will look you square in the eye and say, babe, I done try to tell you you need to get rid of the old rascal. Quit running around chasing him. That ain't, God, ain't what God got for you. You're chasing that. I know he's handsome. I know he's got a fine looking Mustang sitting out in the yard, but you better find somebody to chase because that ain't the one. Thank God for those grandmas. Where are they? Thank God for those dads, those mamas that'll speak up and say, no, no, you ain't got my seal approval. I'm, there's something wrong. I ain't talking about people that got a problem with everything. I'm talking about people that are just honest. Come on now. They're just looking, just square in the eye and say, well, you know, you keep on doing that. You're going to go down the wrong path. And when conviction comes in, people are going to run the other way. And when you try to tell them, you know, you need to get right or we love you or we're trying to invite them to church and they get all stoved up. You know it's usually because your prayers are actually working. 
Well, they're bound and determined. They are not going to say, I'm sorry. That's all right. But that lady that I told you about, that lady, she would get up in church and she'd say, I've been praying for my children. And I'll tell you what, I've been praying, God, I'm going to pray their feet over a fiery ant bed. And she was so sweet that it made it hilarious. I'm just going to pray their feet over a fiery ant bed. I thought to myself, Lord, that'd be terrible because I've been in some ants before. You know what she was saying? I'm praying that the Holy Ghost will get a hold of your heart. The way you've been talking to your mama, you ought to be ashamed. The way you've been treating your parents, you ought to be ashamed. The way you've been doing your boss cheating on your time clock, you ought to be ashamed. The way you've been acting, the things you've been looking at, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. But I'm praying that conviction will get a hold of you because guilt ain't going to do much for you. But conviction will convince you that I need change. Come on now. I've got to change. I can't go on like this. I need change. Somebody say amen to me this morning. Conviction is the language of God that bypasses our emotions, our own boundaries, and speaks directly to the soul about God's boundaries. Conviction this morning is a good thing. A lot of times folks are like, Sister Myers can tell you this and vouch for this. There are times that we have people that we love, and they know that we pray for them. They know it. When they start going through trouble, we've actually had people call us on the phone. Am I not telling the truth? Please, stop praying for me. What, what do you mean? He said, the devil's fighting on the left and the devil's fighting on the right. Everything's falling apart. Please, quit praying for me. I said, no, we ain't going to do that. But God's allowing, God's allowing some things to get tossed around. God's allowing some things to be revealed to you. And what you need to quit doing, quit fighting it. Because the longer you fight it, the longer it's going to get Come on, it's going to get worse. Say amen. They're under conviction. It is imperative, stand to your feet this morning, that we recognize God's conviction. I wanted to point it out to you early on in this message, and I feel like we clarified the point real well. I'm talking about God's conviction. Somebody say God's conviction. Not the preacher. Not mom and daddy. Sometimes God can use that channel to speak to you, but not because you're an authoritative figure but because the Holy Ghost is trying to rescue a soul. This is the reason. Come back up here. All you brethren that were helping me earlier, we're going to close with this. All you brethren that were helping me, come up back up here and assume your positions. If we can get Carl Curtis out the way, huh? We ain't got no no time for that. What we have to understand is just how much is at stake. Some of you quit praying for your kids. Some of you quit praying for your family because they've just been so ornery about it and it seemed like they ain't getting no better. So you just, you know, well, I don't pray as hard as I used to. But you better understand what's at stake. Eternity is a long way off. God forbid that you get that phone call that says your granddaughter just died in a head-on collision. God forbid that you get that phone call that your son just died. Come on, there are some of you that have been through exactly what I'm talking about, and it will rock your world. If you don't believe me, you, you find somebody that's been through it, and you ask them. It will turn your world right side up and dump you right on your head. I can't afford to quit praying. You've got to understand what is at stake. You've got to understand. So when you start trying to intervene and you let your emotions get the best of you, you can, you ever heard the saying, you can cut your nose off and spite your face? So because you two have been at odds with each other, you're going to give them a piece of your mind Maybe driving back a little bit. But do you understand what's at stake? There's a lot of things I have wanted to say to somebody. There's a lot of things I have wanted to do. But I have to remind myself what's at stake. When the Holy Ghost is trying to reach out to them, this is a soul. The Bible said that it is so, such a wonderful thing 
of all the different things that, that, that all of heaven could get in an uproar and celebrate, said all of heaven rejoices when one soul, when one sinner comes to the Lord. It's that, it's that, that significant. This is what is at stake. How can I afford to drive back what God's drawing to Him? How can I afford to get in the way and thwart the efforts, if anything? Do you know what the Bible said? It said love. Love will cover a multitude of sins. Do you know what the Bible says about love? It says by this, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples, that you have love one to another. Listen. I'm going to give you some real good advice as I close this service. You have got to set your emotions. You have got to set your agendas. You've got to set your feelings aside and realize what's at stake. Because sometimes there's people under conviction, and the reason they're so ornery is because they're under conviction. The reason they have put up such a fight is they are under. Your prayers are working. So don't foil the whole thing now and get in the middle of it. And I'm going to tell them how I feel. You better be careful because of what is at stake. I want every head bowed and every eye closed across this church this morning. And I want you to take for just a minute. And I want you to, I want you to say, Lord, is that me? Have you been convicted in my heart and I have looked the other way? Have I ignored your conviction? If that's you, I want you to step out of an aisle right now without reservation, without sitting there thinking, 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 without brushing off the conviction. You just say, Lord, I'm going to yield to you. You may be saved here among us, and you've been trying to do right, but there's a, there's a thing in your life. I, I'm going to call it a thing. There's a thing. There's a thing in your life. That you know that God's not pleased with. And you know that it's, it, it's a stigma to you. And you've been under conviction. Every time you think about it, you, you feel the conviction. Why don't you just step out right now? Come on down to this altar. Brother Souffron, come on and play this piano for me, if you will. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I'm giving you the opportunity this morning to say, Lord... Now that I better understand what conviction is, I yield to it. Do you know how unique that conviction is? God will allow conviction to set certain things up in your life at the right moment. He put that electrician at the right place at the right time. He sent those dreams at the right season of my life to get my attention. He sets things up in a certain way to get your attention. The